Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Stacy. Uh, this is going to be my testimony video. And I've been very um, nervous, hesitant about making this uh, because I don't want it to come across like it's about me at all. Although it is um, my salvation, but it's God's story. And I'm kind of terrible at speaking <laughs> and getting um, my point across. And I don't want to do a disservice to this amazing life-saving <laughs> story of God. So I just want to preface this that I'm going to start my story or this story, God's story with my childhood, because that is very important to the whole testimony. Um, and it's going to sound terrible. It's going to sound like a lifetime movie, but it has the happiest of endings. And that is the whole point of the gospel, the good news. It has the best endings. I also want to stress that today is the day that I'm doing this because God told me to do it. <laughs> God told me to do it today and he told me through his word. I, I was reading Psalm 71 yesterday. I've been thinking a lot about doing this video. I've been thinking a lot about, you know, the words that I want to use, how I want it to come across, and I keep putting it off because I'm sure I'm going to mess it up. And then I read Psalm 71, 15 yesterday, and this is David talking to God, and he says, I will tell everyone about your righteousness all day long. I will proclaim your saving power, though I am not skilled with words. And I read that and I was like, that's me. <laughs> that's me. I don't know how to say this. I don't know how to present this story. Um, I do feel like I suck at words, but I need to be proclaiming his saving power, even if I stink at words. <laughs> so let's go. I was born in 1977 in Baltimore to... Um, a schizophrenic mother and an alcoholic father and uh, they were not in any position to really be having a kid but they did here I am uh, right after I was born like within six months is when my mom was fully diagnosed with schizophrenia she had been sick up until that point she had had what they would call nervous breakdowns back in the day and um, been hospitalized and stuff, but she was actually diagnosed with schizophrenia when I was about six months old. And I'm an only child, so a lot of my childhood I spent completely alone because my dad was an alcoholic, a gambler. Uh, he would go to work during the day, and then from three to about 11 o'clock at night, he would go to the bar, and he basically lived there. Uh, he would come home drunk and go to sleep. And uh, my mom spent a lot of my childhood in different mental institutions. So she could be home with me in the morning. She would make me breakfast, get me off to school. And then I would come home from school and she would be gone. And I knew she was in the hospital. And back in the day, uh, a lot of times the stays for were for 30 days at a time. Also, my dad could have her committed when I was young. He could basically drop her off at the hospital and say, here, take her, you deal with her. And she would be gone for 30 days. So, like I said, a lot of my childhood, I was completely alone and no one explained anything to me. I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't understand that my mom was sick. And all this is important because it will tie into what happens later, but um, I blamed a lot of the, the loneliness, the bad things that happened on my mom. I, Cause I, as a kid, I thought it was her choice to leave. I, I thought, you know, she was choosing to leave me. And so I blamed her a lot and I didn't learn what she was diagnosed with until I was in high school. No one told me it was, it was like kept quiet in my family. Although um, my dad would take me to visit her while she was in the hospital. And that was a whole nother 
horrible situation um, to go to these places because, again, back in the day, they weren't the best of places <laughs> and they, they were scary. And I just didn't understand what was going on and why my mom would choose to be there rather than be at home with me. And so I grew a lot of resentment for her growing up. So while all of this is happening, my mom was also, I remember her calling herself a born again, born again Christian. Uh, my mom would listen to records. She would play records of Christian music. Specifically, I remember hearing um, He Has the Whole World in His Hands, that song. I don't know who sings it, but she played that all the time when I was little. And one Christmas, she bought Jesus a wooden boat and she wrapped it up and put it under the tree. And I was like, well, what is this? And she says, it's Jesus's birthday and we're going to give him a gift. So my mom would talk about um, Jesus, but I never went to church. Um, so here's where I remember God first coming into my life. Uh, when I was little, little, and my mom would be gone and my dad would be gone, I would be home alone and I would be scared. I would hear noises in the house. It would be dark. I would have to put myself to bed. <laughs> and I was, you know, six, seven, eight years old. And God was there with me. I, I, could, I can remember clearly feeling God, but to me, he was my dad. I, oh, I thought of him as my father and I would replace my dad with God and I would lay in bed at night and I would talk to God and I would be like, you know, dad, this, dad, that. And I would tell him about my day and tell him how I was feeling. And he would make me feel better. He, I could feel his presence and I would feel safe and taken care of and protected. I just knew he was there. Um, I knew I wasn't alone. And <sighs> so that is how my relationship with God started. I didn't know what a Christian was. I wouldn't have called myself a Christian. I didn't go to church. I didn't know the Bible stories. I didn't know the gospel. I just knew there was this fatherly presence that was around all the time that made me feel safe and loved. I was not alone. Uh, so he got me through the worst years of my life. <laughs> And as I continued um, to grow, I also continued in my resentment for my mom. Uh, we had a very strained relationship. Schizophrenia makes a person see and hear things that aren't there. And uh, my mom in particular had three voices that she heard nonstop. <sighs> And she heard these voices for over 40 years. These voices were horrible. They said the worst things to her. If you can imagine being possessed by a demon and the things that demons would say to you, that's what these voices would say to my mom. And they would scream at her, they would cuss at her, they would call her names. So my mom was hearing this all the time and then trying to parent me you know, trying to cook me dinner, trying to, you know, take care of me if I was sick. And so she was literally being tortured. But all I saw from my point of view was her screaming at things that weren't there. She would yell at them. She would cuss back at them. She would slam cabinets. She was angry a lot. Um, she would say things that made no sense that were just crazy. Um, she thought people were out to get her and she was just very difficult to be around. And my dad just continued to stay gone. He just continued to drink. And so he left me to deal with her alone. We didn't have other family members to help. So it was just me and her. So I spent my high school years uh, drunk. I basically started um, drinking at 14, 15. I spent a lot of my high school years drunk and high. I smoked a lot of weed. I hung around with the worst people. I got expelled from high school. 
Uh, I had to go to night school for two years. I did graduate. I did. Um, but that was a long, hard road. And um, then as soon as I could possibly get out of my house and move away, I did. I moved in with a boyfriend when I was 18. And that didn't work out. I moved back home. Um, my dad, at that time, I moved in with my dad. My dad was dating a woman who was a heroin addict who ended up overdosing and dying on my living room floor. So I just went from one really awful situation to another. And like I said, this is like a, a lifetime movie, so, um, but has a great ending. So just hold on. So, um, yeah, I just went from one awful thing to the next. And finally I started dating my husband who I had known all through high school. I met my husband when I was 14. Uh, his sister was my best friend all through high school. So I've known him forever and he was in the Marines and um, he got stationed in England. I moved to England. We got married. So we've been together 20, 21 years next month, 21 years in August. And that's been great. Um, and through this time, through this whole time period, I would talk to God. I would pray to God, but I, but I still thought of him as um, like a father figure. And I had this kind of really personal relationship with God, but didn't go to church, didn't read the Bible, didn't know anything about anything, just kept talking to God because it was a being that was there that I could feel. Then after a few years of being married, we had kids. My husband uh, grew up going to churches and he really wanted our kids to go. So we started going to church. Um, and I didn't know this at the time, but it was a progressive church and I was, having a really difficult time with my mom. My mom was very, very sick at this time. And I was praying constantly. I had been praying for her my entire life and nothing ever worked. Um, at least that I could see. She just kept getting worse and more tormented. And I loved her so much, but being around her and watching her go through this, I hated, I hated the disease because at this time I knew what it was. I hated the disease so much and I couldn't yell at the disease. I couldn't do anything about the disease and my prayers weren't working. So then I started taking it out on her. I started being really mean to her because I was so frustrated and so angry. Um, and then I would go to church and I would talk to all the people at the church and I would tell them what was going on and they would say, you just have to pray harder. You just have to pray more. You're not praying enough. Um, you're not praying in the right way. God just wants you to be happy and he wants you to, you know, have everything that you want. And if you pray harder, you'll get it. And after a few years of this, I kind of just broke. And I remember I went out into my garage and I started screaming at God one day just yelling, cussing. I was so mad. And I was saying, you know, I've been praying for years and I'm not asking for something for myself. I'm asking for you to help someone else. It, it wasn't even a selfish prayer. I'm not asking for a car or money. <laughs> so I just could not fathom why he wasn't healing her. Um, and, and from that moment, I kind of walked away. Uh, I, I wouldn't, I never, I never not believed. I was never a non believer because I always felt God. I, it's like saying my arm doesn't exist. Well, I can feel my arm. My arm is here. I know it's there, but I, I kind of hated God. Um, I didn't want to talk to him. I didn't want anything to do with him. I was like, I'm done with you. Um, you're useless <laughs> basically is how I felt. And so I walked away from the church and I walked away from God and I just continued trying to deal with my mom on my own and things kept getting worse and it kept getting harder and okay all right <laughs> this is where it gets really hard so I want to say it was three years now because of my mom's illness she started believing that she had pains that weren't there. 
Um, she had phantom pains is what the doctors called it. So my mom started taking enormous amounts of painkillers. Um, for the first few years, she was getting them prescribed to her from doctors. Um, and then when that ran out, she would just go through bottles and bottles of Tylenol and Advil. So eventually all of that stuff on her stomach started causing severe ulcers and eroding her stomach. Um, so while my mom, so while my mom was getting worse mentally, she was also getting worse physically. And I live in Virginia now and she's still, she was still in Baltimore. So I was driving back and forth and it's a few hours I was driving back and forth to take her to different doctors to try to figure out what's wrong with her and to get her help. And at this time, I also had talked her into getting a helper that was from the state of Maryland. Um, this person would help her set up doctor appointments. They would help her with her medications, get her to her appointments. Um, and it was all free because my mom um, was completely disabled. She hadn't wanted one for years. She didn't trust anybody, but she finally agreed to getting this helper. And it was a huge weight lifted off of me to have someone else to be there with her. And I was so happy. It was the happiest I'd ever been in my life. <laughs> it was the happiest. I, I really, in that moment, I went back to God and was like, thank you. Thank you for, you know, putting this in her life and, and having her accept it. But then within about two weeks, she fired the helper. So I had had this huge boost <laughs> and I was like, yay, everything's going to be great. And then pfft, it tanked again and I was miserable and depressed and angry. And I went up to see her and I took my son. So at the time my son was 15, I think. My son has the patience of a saint and he's always been able to deal with her so well. Um, so I took him with me and I was in her apartment and we got into a huge argument, which was usual. We argued every time we saw each other, we got into a huge argument. I was so mad that she had fired the helper and put all of that stress back on me. Um, so we're screaming at each other. I'm saying I'm leaving. I go to walk out of her apartment and she said something like, you would be happier if I just was dead, right? Like you'd be happier if I wasn't here. And I just looked at her and I don't remember if I said the word or not, but I looked at her so she would know like, yeah, I actually would. Things would be better. It would be easier. And she just kind of, you know, shut the door and I walked down the hallway and I got in the car and I drove home and I was so mad. And we went for a whole week without speaking. And I said to my son one night, I asked him if he could pray for grandma, for his grandma, because I felt like God didn't want to hear it from me. God didn't want to hear my prayers. God wasn't answering my prayers. It didn't matter if I prayed or not. So I thought maybe hearing it from someone else would make a difference. So I asked him sincerely, would you pray for her? Maybe God wants to hear it from you. Maybe God needs to hear it from someone else. And maybe that would help. And my son said, yeah, I'll, I'll pray for her. I don't know if he believed or not at that time, um, because we had left the church several years before that. And he knew how angry I was and we didn't talk about God around here. So I don't know really how he felt about God at that point. I just, I, I needed somebody to do something. So I asked him to do it. And so the next day I got a phone call from my aunt, my mom's sister. They were estranged. They didn't see each other. Um, but she called me and said that my mom had passed away. My mom had died due to complications from her stomach. So um, after I found out that she died, of course, I was 
distraught <laughs> to say the least the last time we talked it, it was a screaming match and I had basically told her it would be better if she were dead and and you can't take those words back and if a person passes away before you can say you're sorry then you, like then what <laughs> like you've lost your chance you know so um that was the last thing that you know i basically said to my mom and then my mom died it's one of those things that you know you read about that doesn't happen in real life though right but yeah it it happened <laughs> it happened to me a few days after me being basically comatose i remembered having that conversation with my son and uh so I asked him, I said, do you remember when I asked you if you would pray for grandma, for God to save her? And he said, yeah. And I said, and here's where I'm really going to cry. I cry every time I tell this story. But um, he said, yeah, I remember. And I said, did you? And he said, I did. <sighs> so. So. I prayed for so long and so hard for him to save her and he didn't. And in that moment, I feel like he was waiting for my son. And he was waiting for my son to come to him. <sighs> and I also realized that all the pain and suffering that my mom went through for decades, I knew that she would go through it all again if that meant it would bring her grandson to God because she loved him so much and she was a believer. So I honestly do believe that her suffering was for a reason her suffering was to bring my son to God um, and me, absolutely, and me, because I know where my mom is. There is no doubt in my mind. I know where my mom is. I've got to get there. <laughs> Not only do I want to be with Jesus, of course, but I have got to see my mom and tell her how sorry I am. And I want to be with her. And I can envision her whole and healed. My mom's not sick anymore. My mom has a perfect body. And she's not crying and she's not suffering. I felt so much peace in that moment. I had no anger. No anger to God. I wasn't mad anymore. I want to add in after she died and I went to clean out her apartment, I found her Bible that I didn't even know she had, but she had a Bible and my mom used to write on index cards all the time and she would just leave them all over her house. Most random things. Sometimes they had horrible things written on them, but in her Bible, these cards were in there and this is her handwriting. She wrote these cards. <laughs> And one of them says, when God wanted us to know what he is like, he chose to emphasize his fatherhood, our father in heaven, Luke 11, 2. What's this one? How crazy is that? <laughs> and um, she also wrote, God's goal is to make us holy, not just happy. And when we are holy, we are more likely to be truly happy and content. If a person who was as sick as my mom could believe this, how can I not? How can I not have all the faith in the world? I just, I can't. It's impossible. I have, I feel so close to God. After this happened, I felt him telling me, get a Bible. You have to read a Bible. Why haven't you read a Bible? Have you read your Bible yet? Did you buy a Bible yet? Like go to the store, go, go now, go get it. Um, I was pushed for about two months. I, it was constant, like get your Bible, where's your Bible. Um, but 
once I got it, I read it straight through. I just, every day I was reading and reading and absorbing everything he wanted me to know. I learned so much in that first year. I learned things that after years of being in church, I had never heard, um, such as the word repent. <laughs> in my church, it was all about God just loves you. God just wants you to be happy. Um, there was never any talk of, well, he wants you to repent. He wants you to turn away from the world, turn away from evil, turn towards him. That wasn't preached at my church. Um, so that first time reading the Bible was shocking to me, but it all made sense. The more I read, the more things fell into place. And I had so many questions. And at first I was like, wait, this contradicts this. And this goes against what that is saying. But the further along I got in it, the more connections I could make. And I'm like, oh, well, this isn't actually contradicting that. This is going along with what this is saying. And it's just, you have, you have to read the whole thing. <laughs> you have to read the whole thing um, to have the full context. And all I'd ever heard throughout my life was, you know, just little verses here and there. So it has been the most amazing experience learning about God. It's mind blowing um, how amazing he is, how awesome he is, and how he will wait for you. He waited for me for decades. He waited for my son. And sometimes he will put you through the toughest situations in order to bring you to him. But it's worth it. It's worth it because there's nothing better than being with God. Like what a nightmare. I can't even, I cannot even imagine not being with God. So anyway, this video is very long. I apologize. I honestly don't know how to make this story shorter because there are so many things that just lead to God and point to God's greatness and his goodness and his love and his saving grace. And he gets all the glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> um, I hope you guys find this helpful in some way. And if you leave with anything, it is how important your Bible is, how important to pray without ceasing is, never give up, and how important it is to ask other people to pray too. Um, we all are the body of Christ. And if one of us hurts, everyone hurts. So that's all I got. Um, I love you guys. I hope you have a great day and I will see y'all soon. Bye.